All right, let's pray. Father, we are grateful for your faithfulness to us. We're grateful that you uphold and strengthen us by your word. We pray, Lord, that you would do that strengthening work in our souls um, so that we would um, uh, be filled with your Holy Spirit, uh, that we'd walk faithfully before you, and that we would have courage to stand firm in the evil day. So give us grace now as we consider your word, and we ask this all in Jesus' name. Amen. Amen. All right, well, um, we all know that we live in a Romans 1 culture, a culture full of high-handed idolatry and ingratitude that then overflows into sexual immorality and debauchery and enslavement, and then circles the drain with every manner of unrighteousness. We're a nation that has rejected God as our father and therefore cut ourselves off from human fatherhood as well, becoming, as Pastor Longshore regularly says, a nation of bastards with all of the social disorder and chaos that necessarily follows. In Aldous Huxley's novel, Brave New World, the citizens are kept docile by a ready supply of meaningless sex and a soothing, happiness-inducing drug called TikTok. No, Soma. It's called Soma. But in our day, video games, pornography, and those endlessly inane videos on your favorite social media platform offer that same pacifying function. As Neil Postman famously said, we amuse ourselves to death. We medicate ourselves into oblivion. At the same time, we've not yet reached Huxley's fully pacified society because our social media actually does a different function. It acts as a, what I call a passions amplification machine. It takes the natural human tendency to lust and to fear and to be angry, and it turns them up to 11. That's how the algorithm works. It's designed to stoke and extend sexual enticement, outrage, and anxiety. And all of this is evidence that we are indeed a nation under judgment. We've exchanged the truth of God for a lie, and therefore God has given us over to the lusts of our hearts and to a debased mind. Claiming to be wise, we've become fools, unable to tell the difference between men and women, beauty and ugliness, good and evil. And we see signs of this judgment all around us, ruled by a monstrous combination of a gynocracy and a demented patriarchy. We have a bureaucratically enabled invasion at our border that unravels social trust across the board. And the triumph of fruitlessness in the party of debauchery, barrenness, and death. Indeed, perhaps a month ago when that bullet whizzed by former President Trump's head, it was an apt metaphor for where we find ourselves. We dodged a bullet. Much like in Amos 4, when God would send many judgments on his people, famine in one area, flood in another, a small plague over here, raiding party over there, each one a mini judgment designed to call God's people to repentance. And yet again and again in that chapter, we're told, yet you did not return to me. And therefore, the prophet says, prepare to meet your God. Prepare to meet your God. And so this is where we find ourselves in an election year, no less. Um, We've perhaps been hoping uh, and praying for a faithful Josiah to rise up, a faithful and reforming magistrate who would lead us back to repentance in the Lord. And yet we have to settle perhaps for a Jehu, a brawler willing to fight the wicked house of Ahab, or worse, it's possible we'll get a cackling Jezebel. So, in that context, in that context, my exhortation and message to you this afternoon is simple. You're going to need that spine. The virtue needed at this hour, and indeed at every hour, is courage. The Bible bears witness to this fact that in times of turbulence, in times of transition, in times of turning in the scriptures, there is a repeated and consistent exhortation given to both God's people as a whole and to individuals within it. Be strong and courageous. So when the people of Israel are about to enter the promised land without Moses, 
What does Moses say to them in Deuteronomy 31, verse 6? Be strong and courageous. When Moses passes the baton of leadership to Joshua, what does he say to Joshua? Be strong and courageous. After Moses dies and the Lord commissions Joshua in Joshua 1, 6, 7, and 9, what does he say three times? Be strong and courageous. In Joshua 10, when Joshua seeks to encourage the people in the midst of the conquest of Canaan, what does he say to them? Be strong and courageous. And then this echoes down throughout Israel's history. In 2 Chronicles chapter 32, God's people are surrounded by the armies of Assyria. King Hezekiah turns to the people and reaches back to those fundamental moments and says to them, be strong and courageous. So again and again, in times of transition, turbulence, and turning, God's people are exhorted, be strong and courageous. You're going to need that spine. So my aim in this message is twofold. First, I want to unpack what biblical courage is. What is it? Where does it come from? And then I just want to give you a few examples of it, some from the Bible, some from outside of it, in hopes that they might stir you up to be strong and courageous. So what is courage? Well, let's begin with a a definition. This is a definition. um, This is in my little book on courage. This is how I define it there. Courage is a habitual, sober-minded, self-possession, a habitual, sober-minded self-possession that overcomes fear through the power of a deeper desire for a greater good. A self-possession that overcomes fear through the power of a deeper desire for a greater good. So let me unpack that, give you some key features of courage. First, courage always involves a double vision. There's going to be a danger out there which produces fear in here. Danger out there that produces fear in here. And there's going to be some good out there that produces a deep desire in here. So something we want and something that we fear. And the interaction and internal conflict surrounding those is where courage comes into play. Second... Courage is a habit. This is important. Um, Courage is not a one-off. It's not a behavior that happens to you every once in a while. It's a habitual exercise of the mind and the heart. It's something that you have to cultivate and something that you have to grow into. Third, it manifests in at least two different ways. On the one hand, courage strains towards the good that we don't have in the face of of risk or danger or death. It it gives and it hazards all in the face of uncertainty. And we call that kind of courage risk-taking or daring. We're reaching for something we don't have despite the dangers before us. On the other hand, courage clings to the good that we do have in the face of pain or also pleasure. So it resists the impulse to flee from the good we possess, to retreat in the face of hardship and difficulty and pain. It refuses to be drawn away from its post by promises of lesser pleasure. And in this form, we call it fortitude or endurance. And you can see the two different kind of images that come to mind there. When we talk about risk-taking or daring, that's what takes the hill. Fortitude holds the hill we've already taken. So risk-taking takes the hill we've not yet got, and fortitude then holds it when the counterattack comes. Both are expressions of courage. And in both expressions, this is fourth, courage avoids two excesses on either side, two ditches. Most obviously, if I were to say, what's the opposite of courage, you would say cowardice. Cowardice shrinks back from danger. It succumbs to the fear. It it refuses to take the risk. It retreats in the face of pain, difficulty, and death. That's cowardice. We're familiar with that. On the other side, courage is the opposite of recklessness or rashness. So courage, true courage, is always guided by reason, by wisdom, by what is true. It recognizes what should be feared and what shouldn't be feared. It keeps the bigger picture in view. Uh, There's a difference between necessary and unnecessary risks. So a man can risk his life for a thrill. 
scale a cliff without, without a rope or skydive out of an airplane, and there's a kind of courage there. Or he may risk his life to save others from danger, rushing into a burning building to rescue a child or going to war to fight for his country. And the former skydiving is a kind of daring, but only the latter is truly courageous. The reason for the risk matters. So to summarize that general definition of courage, here's what we've got. It involves a double vision. It always sees both the danger or hardship in front of us as well as the reward or the good thing beyond it. It arises in the midst of that internal conflict, fear of pain, desire for pleasure, aversion to evil, movement towards the good. These are the tensions that create the context for courage. And this is important because those, those realities, fear and desire, are inescapable. And courage is that habitual exercise of our mind and heart that arranges them properly. It puts the fear in the right place. It's not the absence of fear. Fear is a given. There are fearful things out there. The question is whether they rule, whether they lead, whether they guide and govern. Courage is a stable habit of heart that masters the passion of fear. C.S. Lewis rooted courage in the chest, much as Plato and Aristotle did before him. It's, it's in the chest where courage resides. And he said, courage is not simply one of the virtues, but it's the form of every virtue at the testing point. It's not just one of the virtues. It's not like you have chastity and temperance and all of these other virtues, magnanimity. It's not just you have all of them. And then, oh yeah, also courage. It's that courage runs through all of them. Because if you're only chaste, or honest, or noble when conditions are easy, then you're not truly chaste, honor, or, uh, honest, or noble. You, d- you lack those vir- uh, virtues because you don't have the fortitude to cling to them in the face of hardship, difficulty, pain, and death. Courage can take the form of daring and risk-taking. It can take the form of fortitude without succumbing to ca- cowardice. And here's the thing about courage. When human beings, all human beings, Whenever we encounter real courage, we find it unmistakably beautiful. Everyone admires courage. But as Christians, we're not interested in just a generic courage. We're interested in Christian courage. And there are two key features to Christian courage. First, for the Christian, the greater good that we cling to, the greater good that we pursue is God himself. It's not just the uh, respect of our friends or honor among men, as valuable as those things may be in their place. The greater good that overcomes, that subdues the passion of fear when it rises is Christ himself. He is the joy set before us. He's the source of our strength. So in all of those passages I quoted earlier, Moses to Joshua, Joshua to Israel, Hezekiah, All of them run the same way. I left out the important bit. Be strong and courageous is the exhortation, but there's a reason, a distinctly Christian reason underneath it. Be strong and courageous, for the Lord your God is with you wherever you go. He is both the good that you cling to and the power that enables you to cling to it. So he's both the thing that we grab and he's the the Holy Spirit back here enabling us to hold on when we want to let go. We see this just as clearly in the New Testament. One of the best passages on courage in Philippians chapter 1, Paul expresses his hope from prison that he, with full courage, there's the phrase, will honor God in his body, whether by life or by death. I'm in prison. I know what could happen here. I see it. It's uncertain. I don't know but I want to honor God in my body whether I live or whether I die. He needs courage. And he's confident, he says, that he'll have it. Why? Because, he says, on the one hand, the prayers of the saints and the help of the Holy Spirit. The prayers of the saints and the help of the Holy Spirit will strengthen him in the face of death or torture. And on the other hand, he says, to me, to live is Christ and to die is gain. There it is, gain. There's the good. The good that he clings to by the Spirit's help and the prayers of the saints is Christ, and Christ is gain even if he dies. To depart and be with him is far better than every earthly accommodations. 
That's what makes courage Christian. The presence of God, both as the good we possess and the strength that enables us to possess it, is what makes our courage Christian. In the remainder of our time, I want to give some examples of courage to stir you up by way of reminder. And uh, given the theme of the conference, that it's um, a jovial warrior, at least the bulk of these are going to be lean towards the dudes, lean towards the men. Um, and that's as maybe, but I want to say just right here at the outset, courage is a human virtue, not just a masculine virtue. Okay. Both men and women are called to courage. Now the form that that courage takes is going to look different. It's going to be inflected by whether we're a man or a woman. There's going to be sort of a masculine spin on the virtue and a feminine spin on the virtue that that's, uh, the context in which we have to show courage and, and there are nature and design as men and women. So it's going to look a little different. But courage is required of everybody. So here we go. Masculine courage. I've got a biblical example and then a couple from literature. In the book of Samuel, here's the classic instance, right, of biblical courage. Goliath of Gath is the great Philistine warrior, towering in height, massive in strength, battle-tested, and well-armed. And he defies the armies of Israel, challenging them to single combat. And his stature... His strength, his scorn, and his skill intimidate the men of Israel. We're told in 1 Samuel 17, 11, that King Saul and all of Israel are dismayed and greatly afraid. There's the the, the danger out there that produces the fear in here. And that passion of fear overwhelms them, and they flee. Chapter 17, verse 24. Then young David the shepherd, youngest son of Jesse, is... Nate mentioned last night, brings cheese to his older brothers. And he hears Goliath's mockery. He hears Goliath's defiance. And he recognizes the reproach that has fallen upon God's people because of their fear. By fleeing from this Philistine, Israel has suffered, suffered shame and humiliation. And not just Israel, but Israel's God. David is shocked by their unmanly cowardice. And he volunteers to fight Goliath. He says, let no man's heart fail, there's fear, because of Goliath. Your servant will go and fight with this Philistine. Verse 32. And note that 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 David's courage here is expressed in that willingness, eagerness to fight this enemy. To run into battle, not away from it. King Saul, of course, says, David, you're too young. You don't have the right armor. You're not ready for this. David then reminds him that shepherds must learn courage and violence from a young age in order to protect their flocks from lions and bears. And in describing this, David shows this is Christian courage. Because Listen to what he says. On the one hand, David, this is the paradox of that Christian courage. On the one hand, David said, David says, I struck down the lion. I delivered the lamb from its mouth. David is the one who has struck down these wild beasts. And therefore, he says, I will strike down this uncircumcised Philistine who defies the armies of the living God. I can do it. On the other hand, he says, it was not my own strength. It was not my own skill and prowess, but the Lord himself. He says, the Lord who delivered me from the paw of the lion and from the paw of the bear will deliver me from the hand of the Philistine. You hear that? David is the one who was slinging. It was his skill, his practice that dropped the bears, dropped the lion, and that would drop Goliath. But he said, it was the Lord who delivered me from them. God did it. I I did not do this in my own strength, but in the strength of another. His strength was grounded in the Lord's strength and favor. And I just like want to say here, um, this is why courage doesn't come out of nowhere. You don't wake up one morning and just, boom, courage, there it is. It's cultivated. Okay, in this story, before there was Goliath, there was a lion. And before there was a lion, there was a bear. And before there was a bear, there was wrestling with his brothers in the backyard and being thrown into the air by Jesse, and jumping off the 40-foot cliff at Granite Point, and daily double football practices in the heat. Boys especially need to be thrust into environments that require them to cultivate courage. Here's the biggest guy on the football team. Who wants to take him on? I do. That's why I, I don't tell my boys, hey, be safe. Instead, I say, be wise. Okay? There's a difference. There's a difference. Be safe is, make the, the calculation should be, is there risk involved? 
That's not the calculation I want them to make. There may be good types of risk. Instead, I want it to be, is this the right risk? Is wisdom, is the fear of the Lord, is that governing? It's not just recklessness, but risk may be there. Danger may be there. If there is, and it's the right risk, I want you to run into it, not away from it. I want you to step up to the plate, not shrink back, because you want to be safe. David, again, shows this same courage to Goliath himself. It's one thing to talk smack with the guys back in the tents. It's another thing to show up on the battlefield. And when the giant taunts Israel's God and David himself, David says, you come to me with a sword and with a spear, with a javelin. I come to you in the name of the Lord of hosts, the God of the armies of Israel, whom you have defied. This day, the Lord will deliver you into my hand, and I will strike you down and cut off your head. Again, the Lord will deliver Goliath into David's hand. The Lord will deliver Goliath into David's hand. He will strike down Goliath. That's what it means to courageously fight in the name of the Lord. And this is, this is a particularly masculine form of courage, aggressive, risk-taking, martial, expressed in combat and struggle. And our books and our movies and our plays are filled with scenes like David and Goliath, okay? And these scenes particularly resonate with men. So let's do a little pop quiz right here. Let's see what you guys can do. I'm going to start a line. You see how many of you guys can, fin can finish it, okay? So let's just try it. They may take our lives. That's right. Okay, good. This one's a little bit tougher. I'll give you a little bit more of the quote, see if you can get it. If you find yourself alone, riding in green fields with the sun on your face, do not be troubled, for you are in Elysium, and you are already dead. Brothers, what we do in life... Ladies are like, seriously? Like, I send you to the store to get the groceries you don't even remember, but like that... One more, okay, one more. A day may come when the courage of men fails, when we forsake our friends and break all bonds of fellowship. There we go. All right, so from Braveheart to Gladiator to the Lord of the Rings, we resonate in that moment in the movie when the battle lines are drawn up, the leader stands before his troops to strengthen their resolve, to fan their courage into flame. And they typically end with the leader charging into battle at the head of his men. The classic example of this in, uh, in the history, at least, of the West and in uh, English literature is Shakespeare's Henry V. Okay, so this is the battle, um, this is before the Battle of Agincourt. He's leading uh, their army against the French armies. He wants to reclaim the th throne. At the city of Harfleur, they're going to lay siege to it, and he utters this famous battle speech, which many of you may be familiar with. If you want to go see a great performance of it, you can just search online, Jamie Parker, King Henry Globe Theater. Just go find that little scene of Once More Under the Breach. I'm going to read it for you, and then I'm going to unpack what we see about courage from this speech. Once more under the breach, dear friends, once more, or we'll close the wall up with our English dead. In peace, there's nothing so becomes a man as modest stillness and humility. But when the blast of war blows in our ears, then imitate the action of the tiger. Stiffen the sinews, summon up the blood, disguise fair nature with hard-favored rage. Now lend the eyes a terrible aspect. Let it pry through the portage of the head like a brass cannon. Now set the teeth and stretch the nostrils wide. Hold hard the breath and bend up every spirit to its full height. On, on, you noblest English, whose blood is fed from fathers of warproof. Fathers who, like so many Alexanders, have in these parts from morning till evening fought and sheathed their swords for lack of argument. Dishonor not your mothers. Now attest that those whom you call fathers did beget you. Be copy now to men of grosser blood and teach them how to war. And you, good yeoman, whose limbs were made in England, show us here the metal of your pasture. Let us swear that you are worth your breeding, which I doubt not, for there is none of you so mean and base that hath not noble luster in your eyes. I see you stand like greyhounds in the slips, straining upon the start. The game's afoot. Follow your spirits, and upon this charge, cry God for Harry, England, and St. George. So what do we see here? Courage doesn't quit. Once more unto the breach, dear friends. Once more, again. Do it again. Battering ram, again. Again. 
until we die. We're either going to take the city or we're going to close that wall up with English dead. This is the mark of courage. Second, there are certain virtues that are appropriate for peacetime. Modesty, stillness, tranquility, peacefulness. All of these have their place. But when the war comes, you must rise to something else. And, and note the, the um, bestial imagery. Imitate the action of the tiger. The biblical term here would be, the righteous are as bold as a lion. And the whole body is engaged in this imitation. Facial expressions, furrowed brows, piercing eyes, clenched teeth, flared nostrils, muscles taut, ready to pounce. In other words, Henry here is giving his men a model to emulate. He's showing them, this is what it looks like. I'm calling you to imitate me, and I'm going to lead you into battle. Not just himself as a model, though, right? He draws strength from their noble ancestors. Battle-tested, proven. Like Alexander the Great, they fought from dawn until dusk, sunrise to sunset, until there was no one left to fight. The call to courage is a call to live up to the glory and honor of their fathers and mothers. It's about bearing their ancestral names well. More than that, they're to spread courage to the commoners, right? The noblest English, English are to teach the commoners how to war. And this is instructed to us. We may not live in an aristocratic society like this, but fathers to sons, older brothers to younger brothers, seniors to freshmen. Courage is contagious and it's caught by imitation. Seeing courage sparks courage. And then he calls the commoners to rise to the glory of their country. Doesn't matter where you come from, doesn't matter what you were born. You may be base in birth, but you have a noble luster in your eyes. I can see it. The, encour the encouragement there, the impartation of courage is recognizing the seeds of it in eyes that were probably a little bit scared at that moment. Right? The fear was there, but he bypassed the fear and said, I see that noble luster. I'm calling that out of you to crush the fear. And then the final call, that final encouragement, when he utters his war cry, reminds his men of the God and the good they fight for, invokes the name of St. George the Dragon Slayer, and leads his men once more onto the breach. And significantly, later in the, in the play, after they've won the Battle of Agincourt, they sing non nobis, Domine. Not to us, not to us, but to your name give glory. Like David, this, this battle, this victory in battle was not won in our own strength, but in the strength that God supplied. So here again is masculine courage, valor, taking risks, overcoming obstacles with persistence. It's contagious. It spreads from Henry to his noblemen, from them to the commoners. They, it fortifies his men so they can overcome their fear and fight with an intensity and abandon that will carry them to victory. Last example here on this subject. Um, that speech is echoed down through history. I do think it was part of what inspired, say, Tolkien to write that scene in, in Lord of the Rings and um, shows up in Braveheart and so forth. Um, but one, one place that I think was particularly inspired by this is from The Horse and His Boy. When King Lou, I think, that, I think that that whole book was inspired by this play, by the way. So, Horse and His Boy, Henry V, read those together, super cool. Here's how King Loon expresses the heart of kingship to his sons. This is what it means to be a king. To be first in every desperate attack. To be last in every desperate retreat. And when there's hunger in the land, as must be now and again in bad years, to wear finer clothes and laugh louder at a scantier meal than any man in your land. I've glossed that for years as first in, last out, laughing loudest. And these aren't mere words. King Loon shows, backs up his words with action. When the, when the battle at Anvar takes place, he's out the gates first with his nobles, showing the commoners how to war. He knew deep in his heart that to be a leader means that you have the privilege of dying first. But it's not just about battle and war. It's about leadership in the midst of other trials. In this case, famine. This is key. Don't miss this. Courage is about what happens when things get hard. Okay? When things get hard. When the hard comes, what is your face like? And don't miss the emphasis on laughter here as a key element of courageous kingship. 
It's not dour resolution and somber resignation. It laughs loudest in the midst of the trial. It embraces, this is what we say to our football players, it embraces the grind with joy, not with grumbling, with gladness and not self-pity. No woe is me. And, and David, again, to draw this back, Psalm 19, we talk about this among our uh, football players. David in Psalm 19 talks about the sun as it moves across the sky, and he compares it to a warrior. The, the Hebrew word there, the strong man who runs his course with joy, the Hebrew word there is gibor, it's the warrior. It's the warrior. It's like Joshua Bashabeth running into battle with spear raised, eyes blazing, doing what he was built to do, protecting his people, honoring his God with joy. It's why, okay, just want to see this real quick? Okay. Uh, it's why our special teams for our football team here at Logos, um, when they uh, huddle up and they're going to run down the field, let's just see what happens. Just, you want to see something? Okay. Giborim! Okay, there it is, right? Giborim to the death down the field, okay? We're running into battle with spear raised, eyes blazing like the sun. It's a glad-hearted stability and manifest hopefulness in the face of hardship. And Lewis says that that laughter and gaiety and wholeheartedness, that laughter in the midst of that battle is the natural accompaniment of courage. If that's missing, so is courage. There needs to be that, that laughter and gaiety in order for it to be true, all-in courage. And it's contagious. We could talk about other examples. I love the scene in uh, Cinderella Man. You've seen this movie, Cinderella Man? Jimmy Braddock sitting there at the table. They don't have a lot of food, and his daughter has just eaten her breakfast, and then she looks over at her mom and says, Mama, I want Samoa. Like that, so cute, right? Mama, I want Samoa. And then he's got his meal, and he says, Oh, I was dreaming last night. And I was dreaming that I was at the Ritz and I had a steak this big and a pile of mashed potatoes and I ate all of it. And I'm still full this morning, so you can have mine. And his wife looks at him and she knows he's going to the docks to work and he's gonna have an empty belly. But what's he doing? He's laughing louder at a scantier meal than any man in his land. These are the images of masculine courage in the face of war, death, and hardship. And those who are called to lead others in the home, the church, and the world need models like this of joyful sacrifice and glad-hearted valor and pioneering risk-taking and happy daring to whatever God calls us. And so may God grant us that spirit to rise to the courage of a King Loon, first in, last out, and laughing loudest. But I said this wasn't just a masculine virtue, so let me close with this. Among the Greeks, courage and fortitude were masculine virtues because the pinnacle of the virtue was physical strength, and death in battle. Like that was, if you reached courage, it was, had to be in battle, which meant it was men that could reach it. One of the things that Christianity did to the classical virtue of courage was to transform its pinnacle. And it moved it from uh, battle to martyrdom. And in moving it from mar to, to martyrdom, to those who would sing as they were being burned who would sing psalms when they let the lions out at the Colosseum. One of the things this did is it transformed the virtue. It opened it not only to those who were strong and powerful, but to those who were weak but were of great faith. In other words, it opened it to not just strong and able-bodied men, but to women and children and the weak could also cultivate and display biblical courage, Christian courage. The Bible tells us this, in the book of 1 Peter. You remember this exhortation that Peter gives to Christian wives. They are to be subject to their own husbands, even when their husbands are unbelieving and disobedient. They shouldn't adorn themselves externally with the physical trappings of beauty. Instead, they are to, quote, adorn themselves with the imperishable beauty of a gentle and quiet spirit, which in God's sight is very precious. Now, this gentle and quiet spirit is not a personality trait, okay? So this isn't about introverts versus extroverts, okay? There's no inherent virtue in being a wallflower who never talks. Instead, a gentle and quiet spirit is about spiritual and emotional composure and strength. The, 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 the gentle and quiet spirit is the opposite of the loud spirit, the, one, the woman that shows up in Proverbs and talks about the forbidden woman and the adulteress. She is loud and wayward. Her feet do not stay at home. Proverbs 7 11. 
Paul issues a similar warning. The women who are idlers going about from house to house, also gossips and busybodies saying what they should not, 1 Timothy 5.13. That's the loud spirit. That's the opposite of the gentle and quiet spirit. The one, that, that sort of woman is the one who marries and bears children and mar- manages their households and gives the adversary no occasion for slander. In 1 Peter, Peter explicitly links that gentle and quiet spirit to submission to one's husband. So, um, perishable beauty of a gentle and quiet spirit, which in God's sight is precious, for this is how the holy women who hoped in God used to adorn themselves, by submitting to their own husbands, as Sarah obeyed Abraham, calling him Lord. So, in, in verse 4 of 1 Peter, the adornment is that gentle and quiet spirit. Composure, spiritual composure and emotional strength. In verse 5, that adornment, same adornment, is Sarah-like submission to one's husband. And then in verse 7, Peter ties it all together with courage. He says, you are her children if you do good and do not fear anything that is frightening. There's courage. So Sarah here is presented as a model of courage. Sarah's children don't fear anything that's frightening. That means there are things that are frightening. It's a matter of inner fortitude and mental strength to overcome them. And so before courage ever expresses itself in action, Peter says it's a matter of the hidden person of the heart, the composure of the soul. And this isn't about, again, personality. It's grace-wrought effort to subdue her fears. Because here's the reality, right? It is a fearful thing to follow a fallible man. It's a fearful thing to follow a fallible man. Just imagine, again, go back to that story, the day that Abraham comes home and says, honey, we're moving. Oh, where are we going? I don't know. God appeared to me and told, told me to leave our country and our kindred and our father's house and go where he's going to show us. Wait, leave everyone? my parents and your parents, everything we've known, and you don't know anything about this place? Well, actually, I'm fairly certain that we'll probably have tyrannical kings who will try to kill me and take you into their harem. (laughs) Also, there's giants. So that's where we're going. And Sarah says, I'm in. I'll follow you. In the face of of many things that were frightening. She found an inner strength of heart, a fortitude, a gentle and composed spirit. Where did it come from? It came from a vibrant and a living hope in God. Like Joshua and the people of Israel, Sarah and her daughters must be strong and courageous because they know and believe deep in their bones God is with us and he's for us. It's such hope that that firmly believes that hardships, trials, and dangers are instruments in the hands of a good God for our good. No matter how hard this gets, this is for my good. And I'm clinging to God in the midst of it. It subdues, and therefore it subdues the passion of fear and the anxiety that rises up. What's going to happen? I can't control the future. What about the kids? And again, there's a joy here as well. I noted men are to be first in, last out, laughing loudest. But it's, no, it's, it's not a throwaway that when the Proverbs 31 woman is described, one of the key traits ascribed to her is that she laughs at the time to come. She looks at the future with all of the possibilities, the horrific ones, and she says, bring it on. Sarah is a model of this sober-minded, hope-filled obedience and submission to her husband. Because of her hope in God, she conquered her fears, maintained that gentle spirit in submission first to God and then to Abram. And that's how we see that Sarah's femininity inflected her courage, right? Her courage did not manifest in the aggressive valor of the warrior. For example, when Lot and his family ran into those giants, big battle of giants, five kings here, five kings there, fighting it out, and Lot and his family become plunder for giants, okay? Abram grabbed his 318 fighting men, his 318 giborim, grabbed their swords and ran off to rescue. Sarah did not. Instead, her courage expressed itself in staying there with her husband 
surrounded by the giants. She honored him by, his, by her speech, right? That's what, particularly what Peter draws attention to. She called him Lord. And I think that's so fun because um, Peter highlights that it's the, she called him Lord. And it's from Genesis 18, 12. And this is uh, when God is telling Abram, uh, you're going to have a child. Sarah's going to have a child. And Sarah's outside the tent. And she laughed to herself saying, after I am worn out and my Lord is old, shall I have pleasure? Like, are you kidding me? After all these years, I'm going to have a kid now. She laughs about it, right? And she calls him Lord. And what's remarkable is that Peter picks up on that use of the word Lord and said, that's a submission word. In other words, this is just how she talked about Abram. This is just the kind of respect that was just on the tip of her tongue. It's unremarkable. She just orients to him. She's a lady and he's her Lord. She's a wife. He's her husband. And that's how she orients to him. And Peter sees, Peter sees significance in that simple title. And therefore, she is a great and holy woman, hoping in God, honoring her husband, and becoming a model of Christian courage. So to sum up, courage is a stable habit of the heart that masters the passions, especially the passion of fear. And it does so through the power of a superior desire for the greatest good, namely God. It subdues fears through hope in Christ. It's, it's common to both sexes, both men and women, but whatever form it takes, it's a marvelous and a wonderful thing. And so as we face 2024, and whatever 2025, wait for the sequel, buckle up, we face many things that are frightening. And so you're going to need that spine. So be strong and courageous. First in, last out, laughing loudest. Don't fear anything that is frightening, but laugh at the time to come. Take heart, for the Lord your God is with you wherever you go. Thank you. Thank you.